Good evening, everyone. I know this is an enthusiastic crowd. I know you're, you're ready to get into it. OK, let's start. Dog whistle politics. So the idea is that racism has evolved, that the ugly slurs that dominated politics up to 50 years ago have no place in politics now. Indeed, you can end your career if you were to use certain racial epithets. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that racism has disappeared. It means it's evolved. Racism in public now occurs on two levels, always on two levels. One allows deniability. One says this isn't about race at all. Think welfare queen. It's just about people on welfare. The other triggers racial anxieties. And so that's the notion of dog whistle politics. Like a dog whistle, on one level you can't hear it. On another, it has a piercing effect. OK, so dog whistle politics. Now, at the outset, I want to make it very clear. I'm going to talk a lot about race this evening. This is not first and foremost about race. This is first and foremost about how certain political speech has been used to wreck the middle class. The story I'm telling is really a story of economic crisis. The story I'm telling is, how did we get here to where we have levels of wealth inequality we haven't seen in 100 years? How did that happen? And the answer is going to be racial discourse. But I really want to keep everybody's eyes focused on the idea that we're trying to figure out what has happened to our society. And how is it that the middle class is in crisis? And why do we have levels of wealth inequality not seen in a century? OK, so the story begins a century ago. A century ago, we had concentrated wealth. We had large corporations. We had family fortunes. They penetrated politics. They controlled government. You had the Roaring Twenties. Everybody was making boatloads of money. Then you had financial collapse. And then you had the Great Depression. And with the Great Depression, the country came to realize that government, which must set the rules of the marketplace, should not set the rules of the marketplace in a way that favors the very rich, but instead should set the rules of the marketplace and the rules of politics in a way that helps everybody broadly. And that meant regulating concentrated wealth, progressive taxation, taxing the very rich to help everybody else, um, creating upward routes of mobility, which includes education and also mortgage assistance, and creating a social safety net to catch people when they fall, either because of wide vicissitudes, right, uh, uh, crisis in the economy, or because of personal tragedy. That's New Deal liberalism. That's New Deal liberalism, and those programs produced the largest expansion of the middle class the world has ever seen. Right? Those sorts of programs were embraced widely by Democrats and by Republicans for a 30-year-plus period. Right? Think Eisenhower and Social Security. They were opposed by this person, Barry Goldwater, 1964. Now, Goldwater, so I have a picture of him with his cowboy hat. Right? This is Goldwater who, in his persona, affected a rough-and-tumble cowboy, even though he was a scion of a wealthy retail family. But this persona had an ideological component. What it said was, real men don't need help from government. Right? The rugged individual doesn't need help from government. And what Goldwater stood for was a politics that said, we should slash taxes for the rich. We should deregulate the economy. We should slash spending on social services. In other words, Goldwater was a, a, a severe critic and opponent of the New Deal. But at this time, the New Deal, as I said, was widely popular. So Goldwater decided in 1964 that rather than campaign actively against the New Deal, he would campaign on the basis of race. In his homely way, he said, we should go hunting where the ducks are. So particularly in the South, Goldwater campaigned by shifting to dog whistle politics. He started to talk about states' rights. He started to talk about freedom of association. Now, on the surface, these terms seem quite abstract. State rights, I mean, we're going to talk about federalism and freedom of association, a version of, li of liberty. But everybody at the time understood. States' rights meant the right of southern states to resist the federal mandate of racial integration. And freedom of association, that meant the freedom of white business owners to exclude African Americans from their places of business. Everybody at the time knew what these terms meant. Let me bring it to Martin Luther King. This is what Martin Luther King had to say about Barry Goldwater's campaign in 1964. Now, this quote is important on several levels. First, it's important because 
it goes to this idea that the Democratic and the Republican Party had both embraced New Deal liberalism. Reflecting that, up until 1964, Martin Luther King had been strictly nonpartisan. He hadn't spoken out in favor of one party or the other because both of them broadly supported the New Deal and both of them broadly supported civil rights. And I want to emphasize that point because it's important. The story I'm telling is not a story of racism and conservatism being somehow inherently linked. Not at all. This is a story of some individuals making a strategic choice to use racism to bolster conservative attacks on the New Deal. But this is not to say that there's some inherent connection between conservatism and racism. Right? Martin Luther King speaks out against Barry Goldwater. He urges all African Americans and all white persons of goodwill to vote against him and, to, and against any Republican who won't disassociate himself from them. This is important. When I talk about dog whistle politics now, I often say, look, the Republican Party is supported by 90% uh, of the support for the, Republican, for the Republican Party comes from whites. 98% of Republican elected officials are white. And when I say that, that's, those are figures from today, I get this rejoinder. Isn't it true that over 90% of African Americans support Obama? And therefore, isn't this just, just about a racial sort of segregation in politics? And I want to say, no. Right. In 1960, 29% of African Americans identified as Republican. In 1964, that percentage dropped to zero. African Americans left the Republican Party not out of racial loyalty to a black president 50 years down the road, <laughs> but out of sort of, but, but because they understood the message that Barry Goldwater was sending when he talked about states' rights and, and freedom of association. This is the last point I want to make about this quote, and I think it's a very important one. Martin Luther King understood that racial justice and economic justice were inextricably connected. He understood it in two different ways. He understood that for minorities, there wouldn't be racial justice without jobs. And he understood heading in the other direction, that you couldn't have broad economic justice for everybody unless we could stop being divided by race. Right? And this was the point of the Poor People's March on Washington that he was laboring on in the months before his death. But he also saw that the connection between economic justice and racial justice could be broken. That people could use racial justice as a weapon against economic justice. And he understood that Barry Goldwater was doing exactly this, seeking to use race to create opposition, to create hostility to policies that were broadly redistributive. Goldwater was crushed. He lost big all across the country. And Martin Luther King responded with this quote, in the recent election, the American people chose to build a great society rather than to wallow in the past. But in those red states in the deep south, a warning was rising. The Deep South hadn't voted Republican in generations. Deeply, deeply committed to the New Deal. And yet in those deep southern states, the other one here is Arizona, the home state of Barry Goldwater. But in the Deep South, this deep south states, committed Democrats, diehard proponents of the New Deal, vote for a Republican opponent of the New Deal when appealed to in racial terms, right? and this was the warning. Richard Nixon, 1968, he runs as a moderate Republican. He's not clear yet whether race can be used to break the New Deal coalition. He begins to get a sense of it late in the campaign, but it's not until 1970 that it becomes clear to Republican and Democratic strategists alike Racial appeals, increasing racial anxiety being generated by the civil rights movement can be used to break the New Deal coalition. Nixon runs for re-election in 1972, and he runs using dog whistle terms. He comes out in favor of states' rights, in particular the right of southern states to set the pace of school integration at their own terms. He also comes out against, quote, forced busing, as if the issue in the North was putting school children on buses rather than the integration it was designed to achieve. 
That's the result in 1972. In 1964, Johnson won almost two-thirds of all votes from whites. For an ardent supporter of the New Deal, in 1972, eight years later, 70% of whites voted for Richard Nixon. But as I say, Richard Nixon was something of an economic moderate. It's Ronald Reagan who enters politics as a supporter of Barry Goldwater, who really combines the two elements that are so central to this story. A deep understanding of the cultural power of racial provocation and also an ideological fervor to dismantle the New Deal. So Reagan begins the campaign. This is in Neshoba County, Mississippi, right outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, where 16 years earlier, three civil rights workers were lynched. This is their bodies found a month later. 16 years earlier. That is, there wasn't a voter alive in Philadelphia, Mississippi when, when Reagan was speaking there who hadn't been alive when these three civil rights workers were lynched. And what did Reagan say? This is his first speech to the country after securing the nomination of the Republican Party. And he came down to Philadelphia, Mississippi to extol states' rights. And this is where he did it. Now, he also campaigned uh, uh, against welfare queens. I, I, I mentioned that earlier. I want to tell you another sort of campaign a stock speech that he would give. He would tell his audiences, I sympathize with you waiting in line to buy hamburger while some young fellow ahead of you buys a T-bone steak with food stamps. Right? Now, in the South, the first time he said it, he wasn't that subtle. He said, some young buck, right? a clearly racial term. But that shriek was just too loud. So he switched to some young fellow. Now, you understand the way in which welfare queen and some young fellow waiting to buy T-bone steak with food stamps, you understand the way in which welfare is being constructed as a proxy term for undeserving lazy minorities, right? It's operating as a dog whistle. But I want you to see also that there's a second character in that story. There's the you that Reagan is addressing that's voting for Reagan. And that you implicitly is the hardworking tax-paying white middle class. And this is very important because he's telling a story to the white middle class in which their taxes are going to undeserving minorities. And as a result, Reagan enacts massive tax cuts over the course of his two administrations. For the middle class? No. For the very rich. Over the 1980s, because of Reagan tax cuts, over a trillion dollars of wealth is transferred to the top 1% of this country. And because those tax cuts have never uh, 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 been rescinded, in each decade since, another trillion dollars in wealth has been transferred to the top 1% of the country. This is the story of dog whistle politics. People think they're voting against lazy, undeserving minorities, and they're voting for massive transfers of wealth to the very rich. Willie Horton. You all recognize this. Here's what I want to say. This, this ad got George H.W. Bush elected. He was behind in the polls before it aired. OK, here's what I want to say. This ad today stands as a sort of shorthand for illicit racial appeals. It was three years before the media came to understand and generally accept that this, was, that this had the stink of racial appeal upon it. Three years during which the media did investigations, interviewed a whole bunch of people, and finally came up with some smoking gun quotes, including from people like Roger Ailes, now head of, of uh, Fox News. Three years. And the point is, dog whistle appeals to work must work on two levels. One seemingly neutral, and the other stirring racial passions. When they stop working, when they're too egregious, they fail. But something else arises to take its place. Dog whistle terms are constantly evolving. And, and we're lagging in our ability to recognize them as such. So that often by the time society understands that, these, that, these, that, that, that this is going on, the damage has already been done. Contemporary versions of dog whistle politics 
I want to suggest that the language of race has changed again, that over the last decade, hysteria around undocumented immigrants is, fu is functioning as, un as, as dog whistle politics. All this talk about illegal aliens and the threat and their law breaking and what they're doing to our country. I want to suggest that on one level, people are always saying, no, this is just about illegality. This is just about behavior. But on another, this has a serious racial undertone to it. Or how about Sharia law? Why the obsession with Sharia law? Kansas passed a law making sure that it would not be enacted in its courts. Why the obsession with Sharia law? Why the constant drumbeat of insinuations about Obama as a Muslim? Because Islam and Sharia are now also functioning as dog whistle terms. On one level, they can be defended as just about religion. But on another, they're triggering a racial xenophobic fear of brown others threatening us from abroad and now penetrating the heartland. Oh, Newt Gingrich. I guess we're up to the 2012 election. And if I become the nominee, I'm going to take a very simple symbol. I'm going to, I'm going to have food stamps versus paychecks. President Obama is the most effective food stamp president in American history. No president has put more people on food stamps than Obama. Now, this is not an attack. It's a statement. It's not negative. It's a fact. I would like to be the best paycheck president in American history. It's not negative, it's a fact. That's dog whistle politics. Because on one level he can say, race baiting? Me? You gotta be kidding. And on the other he can say, best food stamp president in American history. Right? And food stamp here is operating the same way it operated for Ronald Reagan, as a way to trigger fears of undeserving minorities. Right? But, okay, 2012, Gingrich, yes, he was for a time the leading Republican candidate, but ultimately not. And you know, and you can say he, this was part of his fringe campaign. This uh, this talk in particular occurred in the South. Maybe dog whistle politics only occurs at the fringe. All right. this, this is one of the slogans that that Mitt Romney used repeatedly. We're about to watch an ad that Mitt Romney won. Now, here's what's important about this ad. A, Romney spent half his advertising budget running this ad. Half. B, the factual predicate for this ad is fraudulent. Right? He's going to make a claim about, welfare, about Obama and welfare. PolitiFax is going to say, pants on fire in terms of the underlying claim. And one of the Romney campaign officers is going to say, we're not going to let our campaign be dictated by the facts. That's in response to this ad. In 1996, President Clinton and a bipartisan Congress helped end welfare as we know it by requiring work for welfare. But on July 12th, President Obama quietly announced a plan to gut welfare reform by dropping work requirements. Under Obama's plan, you wouldn't have to work and wouldn't have to train for a job. They just send you your welfare check. And welfare to work goes back to being plain old welfare. Mitt Romney will restore the work requirement because it works. I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. Half his budget, running an ad, trying to fraudulently link Obama to welfare. Right? This is dog whistle politics at the very heart of Mitt Romney's campaign. And yet, I think there's another clip of Mitt Romney, one with which you're all f familiar, but which people tend not to associate with dog whistle politics. There are 47% of the people who vote for the president no matter what. All right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that, that they are victims, who believe that government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. But that's it's an entitlement, and government should give it to them. And they will vote for this president no matter what. And, and I mean, the president starts off with 48, 49, 48. He starts off with a huge number. These are people who pay no income tax. Forty-seven percent of Americans pay no income tax. So our message of low taxes doesn't connect. And you'll be out there talking about tax cuts for the rich. I mean, that's what they sell every every four years. And uh, and so my job is not to worry about those people. I'll never convince them that they should take personal responsibility and care for their lives. What I have to do is convince the five to ten percent in the center that are independent, that are thoughtful, that look at voting one way or the other, depending upon 
in some cases emotion, whether they like the guy or not. All right. Half the country. Now listen to the terms. Refuse to take personal responsibility. Dependent. Entitlement. These are all dog whistle terms that have previously been applied to people of color. But now they're being used to describe half the country. Right? So on this level, what we see is Mitt Romney transferring this narrative about the New Deal state as a state that's good for, sorry, as the New Deal state as giveaways to minorities. He's transferring that story to the country as a whole. And he's saying, I don't have to worry about half the country. Half the country I can write off. Half the country because they're implicitly like undeserving minorities. But it's even more egregious than that. Because if you switch and say, OK, then substantively, what did Romney promise to do? You hear echoes of Barry Goldwater. He said he was going to cut taxes for the very rich, that he was going to slash social services, that he was going to deregulate the economy, indeed, that he was going to defund large swaths of government. He promised a war on good government. That's what he said he'd do. Right? So here's Mitt Romney linking Obama to welfare, disparaging half the population, promising a war on government. And now the good news, the good news is he lost. <laughs> the bad news is he didn't lose among whites. He won three out of five white votes. And now people tend to say, well, he won among white men. He did. And he won among white women. Or people tend to say, yeah, but that's the older generation still steeped in ugly racial prejudices. He won in every age cohort of white voters. Or people tend to say, that's the South. Indeed, another term for dog whistle politics is the Southern strategy. Mitt Romney won in 46 of 50 states among whites. Right? Dog whistle politics has now convinced sizable majorities of whites, men and women, every age cohort all across the country, that the New Deal activist state is just giving things away to minorities, and that in the midst of the greatest economic calamity since the Great Depression, and in the presence of the largest concentrations of wealth that we have seen in 100 years, they should vote for a candidate who plant promises to give money to the very rich, to deregulate the economy, and to slash social services. And that's how they're voting. Right? And that's the connection between dog whistle politics and where we are now. Ta-da! <laughs> All right. All right, so that's, that's it for my formal remarks. There was a smattering of applause. I want to encourage that. <laughs> so I grew up in Hawaii. I'm biracial. My, my father's white. My mother's Latina. Um, um, in Hawaii, I didn't think that much about race. Um, uh, in fact, I should, I should add, Barack Obama and I were classmates in high school. Right? He was a few years ahead of me, but, I, but, but we were classmates in high school. We were also classmates at law school, where because he'd taken some years off, we actually overlapped. Um, it was in law school that I really started to think about racism. And, and it was really in law school that I decided that I would become a law professor and that, and that my main focus would be race in American law. But I want to say, I studied with this professor, Derek Bell, who was a fabulous professor, one of the sort of early uh, leaders in critical race theory. Um, and though I studied with him, I actually broke with him in law school. I was attending one of his classes, and then mid-semester, I simply stopped attending. And it was un wasn't until just the last few years um, uh, that he and I were able to repair our relationship. Why did I break with him? Because he was telling a story, in fact, when I was studying with him, he was just about to publish a book called The Permanence of Racism. And we were studying that book. And I just could not accept the premise that racism was permanent. And in particular, um, uh, you know, a part of it was sort of, sort of analytic. I said, slavery ended, Jim Crow was bad, Jim Crow ended. Civil rights movement, yeah, there's still a lot of racism, but we've made remarkable progress. So part of it was sort of that sort of an analysis. 
But part of it was just personal. I looked at his position as a Harvard professor. I looked at my position as a biracial kid who was at Harvard Law School, and I felt like this was the sort of privilege that would not have been possible 30, 40 years earlier. Clearly, this signified progress. What I didn't understand was that he wasn't saying permanent as in fixed and unchanging. He was saying permanent as in it continually adapts. And in its adaptation, it continues to have tremendous power over our society. So for me, and for me, the lesson, I came to understand that just in the last few years. In fact, he invited me to give a lecture named in his honor, um, which I did in uh, of, of fall of uh, 2012. This book actually comes out of that lecture. Now, he passed away a month before the lecture. So he didn't get to hear me say, you were right. <laughs> but, but it's a really important point, and I think there's two points, that I, or, there's two really important things going on there. One is, it's easy to reject a thesis that says, hey, racism continues to really distort our society, especially if we're not ourselves personally afflicted by it. Um, uh, but it's important not to simply reject it because it seems so awful to have to engage with that. It's really important to, to think long and hard about whether it might not be true. So that's one lesson. Here's the other lesson. This is a story about racism that isn't about me. It isn't about Obama. It isn't about the fact that some people of color can now succeed and really, unlike President Obama, achieve incredible levels in our society. That too is part of a wonderful story about how races, race has changed, in some ways it has ameliorated, but that shouldn't undercut the idea that it has also evolved in a way that is doing, that continues to do tremendous damage to all of us. It seems to me that a, the downside of the civil rights movement and of its success is that it inevitably creates that, that fear. It is, it's a struggle between my rights and your rights. And my question is, would it not be useful to try to introduce a vocabulary more of human rights than civil rights to talk about the Declaration of Independence, if you will, rather than the Constitution? Sure, that's a wonderful question. Um, so let me answer it in a couple of different ways. One, so one question is, uh, should we talk about civil rights? Do we need civil rights? Or can we, can we pick some alternative vocabulary? And here, let me, be, let me be clear. Whatever alternative vocabulary you pick, it pretty quickly comes to take on a racial cast. So you don't like civil rights and you say human rights, people figure out you're talking about minorities. It's, it's one of the biggest human rights issues in the country. Or you don't want to say that, maybe you should say uh, diversity. It didn't take people too long to figure out that diversity was code for racial inclusion. So now you get progressive saying, why don't we talk about opportunity? It won't be too long before people understand that when you say opportunity, you mean minorities. And in all of these strategies, we lose. Right? I said earlier that in 1970, democratic strategists too came to understand that race was going to be used as a wedge issue to break up the New Deal coalition. What did they propose? that the Democratic Party should distance itself from minorities, right? What did Bill Clinton do to get elected? He distanced himself from minorities. He also, quote, ended welfare as we know it, which is another way of saying he himself engaged in dog whistle politics. In fact, where Reagan had used a war on crime to gin up fear of minorities as criminal predators, Clinton accelerated that to an extent that Reagan could never have dreamed about throwing billions of dollars into the war on crime that today has produced racialized mass incarceration. But it's not just that Clinton shifted to the right on race, he shifted to the right on domestic politics and on international politics. He also abandoned unions, right? He also shifted, the whole new Democrat is a, is a version of Republicanism, right? So that this effort to avoid race doesn't avoid race, but it does shift, the, shift liberals and shift Democrats away from liberal policies and towards conservative policies. And why does it do that? And this is very important in terms of Barack Obama. Why does it do that? 
because liberalism itself is understood as a racial giveaway. So that the only way that Democrats can insulate themselves from this sort of racial politics is to not be liberal. In other words, they can be moderate Republicans, as the Republicans become, of course, more and more extreme Republicans. Right? And even Obama has said, in the wake of his re-election, he said, if I had the policies now in the 1980s, I would be understood as a Republican. Right? Both parties have shifted remarkably to the right because of the force of this racial politics, and the Democrats have shifted in part because they refuse to address race. So whatever we do, we need to talk about race, and we need to talk about it explicitly. So here's the second answer to the question. In the book, I say not that we need a, a return to traditional civil rights remedies of the sort from the 1960s. I actually say something different. I say, look, we're no longer in the 1960s. We're no longer in the 1970s. We're no longer a country that understands that race is a major uh, force for social inequality. We are like the 1914s. This is like 100 years ago, not 50 years ago, because 100 years ago, the country as a whole, or I should say whites as a whole, felt that the major racial issue of our day, slavery, had been solved. And that they didn't want to talk about race anymore. Yet there was a nascent civil rights organization, the NAACP, that saw its main role not in passing civil rights legislation, which was never going to get through Congress at the time, and we won't get major civil rights legislation through this Congress either, but instead the NAACP saw its role in terms of consciousness raising. It wanted to say to people, racism is still out there and it's still brutalizing people. And so for me, the iconic picture is the NAACP New York office hoisting that flag that says, today a man was lynched. And what they meant was, hey, New York, hey, nation, wake up. Racism is still a tremendous problem. That's the sort of civil rights movement we need now. A renewed effort on the part of civil rights organizations, progressives, unions, foundations, to, to talk about the power of racism today. Because frankly, the vast majority of the public is firmly committed to the idea that we're post-racial. And it's exactly that post-racialism that allows dog whistle politics to continue unchecked. Is there any science uh, that that you know about, um, that's observed how... Using these tactics might actually increase racism? Um, so, this is, so this is one of the joys of being a law professor, is that, is that you can be eclectic on all the different methodologies that you draw on. So, so this is a book that's part history, part sociology, part psychology. Um, and so there's quite a bit of psychological evidence about how, and, and part political science. Uh, so in, other, in other words, I'm going to be hated across four disciplines. <laughs> and, and law, so five. OK. Um, so there's quite a bit of really good social science on, on how this works. Um, you're asking an interesting question. Is there a way to measure whether the racial provocations themselves stimulate racial antipathy? I want to suggest, and I don't, I want to suggest that cognitive psychology has actually documented this, but unwittingly. So cognitive psychology starts moving towards what they call the modern racism scale in the early 1970s. And they say, look, you can't measure racism the way you used to measure it. You can't measure racism by asking people whether they would impose racially mixed marriages, for example. But you can measure a racial antagonism by asking whether, whether people think um, um, that blacks prefer uh, to be on welfare or to work. Or you can ask it uh, in terms of asking whether um, people feel that public schools are safe. Or, and they have a, a, a series of different questions. And when you think about what the questions are asking, the questions are asking basically whether people respond to dog whistle themes. Right? And they're using that to measure racism, but it's also measuring political conservatism. Right. And so I would suggest that what cognitive psychologists have really been doing, I'm sorry, social psychologists, what social psychologists have really been doing is in shifting to a modern racism scale, they've been documenting the way racism has evolved in a way that aligns with dog whistle narratives. Please. Have you come up with any ideas as to how to attract more white allies to be more thoughtful about racism and how it, how it um, grows 
and how it's expressed in society and to root it out of themselves. So, so I want to I wanna answer that question by, by kind of looking at this room. <laughs> you know, so this is a fabulous turnout. And, and, and now I'll, I'll be Colbert. I can't tell, but I think a lot of you are white. <laughs> right? I, this is a fabulous turnout. People, so here's what I think. I think people are really hungry for a new narrative. I think people understand that we're being manipulated by politicians. I think they understand that something has gone badly awry in our country. Um, they understand that it's connected up with economic inequality. They understand it's connected up with rhetoric. And they want a story that makes sense of what's going on. So in this sense, dog whistle politics, I think the term is latent out there. People have heard it. And I think, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the idea that, you know, some politicians engage in racial pandering. What I'm adding is I'm saying it's not marginal, it's not vestigial, this is the heart of the political project, and it's not just race, it's about demonizing liberalism, right? But I actually think there's a lot of people who are ready for that message. So in that sense, what's really necessary, let me back up and, and, and do it this way. Why don't liberals talk about race? What is it about present racial discourse that keeps liberals from talking about race? Let me tell you how present racial discourse works. It works through what I call the punch, parry, and kick of dog whistle politics. The punch, dog whistle terms that constantly punch racial insinuations into the conversation, right? Obama is the, per is the best food stamp president in history. The parry, since I didn't use a racial slur or directly reference race, I can't be racist. Right, this is a Gingrich, it's just a fact. The kick, since you, liberal critic, just said the word race, you're the racist. Stop playing the race card, right? So I have to say, so I'm easy to find on, on the internet. People are starting to send me emails. Not all of them are flattering. Uh, I, I just received one that said, Professor Lopez, you are a race baiting pig, right? No, whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, but, but listen to the rhetoric. I try and say we are all being crippled by this racial politics and I'm attacked as a racist, right? That's the standard repertoire. Those are the standard moves. So to reach out to people and to, and to get people to be able to talk about race, we need to give an answer. And I think the answer is very simple. It's, listen, the person who dialed 911 didn't necessarily commit the crime. The person who pulls a fire alarm didn't necessarily set the fire. Right? We need a quick response. We need to stand up and we need to say, we see your game. We see the punch parrying kick. But because I'm protesting continued racism doesn't make me the racist. We need to talk about race and how it's harming all of us. And I think if we're willing to engage in that conversation with each other, I think there's going to be a lot of open ears. Sir, can you take the arguments of dog whistle racism, as I might call it, and with the help of fellow professors of different eclectic fields, weave a brief to the US Supreme Court to get them <laughs> to uh, bring back the Voting Rights Act or to make them ashamed not to? No. <laughs> but, Darn. But, but the reason's important. So this is part of this narrative about who I am and how I got here. Um, so I, I'm a professor of race law. Now my main, I, I, I teach constitutional law. Um, um, my main focus is on race and racism as a theoretical matter, but, but always connected with law. And so something really remarkable, something really tragic has happened in the law regarding race, and that is that it has flipped. Right? It has been since 1979 that the Supreme Court, using its current understanding of racism, has found on behalf of minorities. The Supreme Court currently understands racism only as intentional discrimination provable through a confession, an utterance, right? This is, this, this is, this is in fact, the parry is part of constitutional law. Before you can prove racism, somebody needs to say that they had a racial intent. Now, hello, <laughs> bigots have figured out you don't confess racial animus, you just hurt people, right? And so not since Jimmy Carter was in the White House has the Supreme Court used this understanding of racism to protect minorities, to find for minorities? On the other hand, when is race mentioned? Affirmative action. 
And if racism is the express use of race, then affirmative action is racism. And so basically since the 1980s, the Supreme Court has been striking down almost every single case in which there are white plaintiffs saying, we are being harmed, we are being racially discriminated against, right? So the, the equal protection has flipped. It no longer protects minorities. But now it strikes down every effort at racial integration because those efforts expressly mention race. So I wanted to tell this story. And I spent a decade studying the cases, studying the doctrine. I wrote two very long articles, which I will not urge upon you, <laughs> unless you really want to read them. But I wrote two very long articles really grappling with the doctrine. And then I said, it's not the doctrine. It's not what they're saying. It's not the story they're telling in the cases. What happened? What happened was that race began to be used as a way to get elected. Affirmative action itself began to operate as a dog whistle term under the, under the Reagan administration. Right? Reagan would say, this isn't about race. I'm for the principle that nobody should be discriminated against. But implicitly, it was discrimination against whites in favor of minorities. That was the story. Right? Now, the presidents who were getting elected through dog whistle terms, Reagan, the two Bushes, they also appointed the five justices who form a solid block on the Supreme Court to continually strike down remedies that would help minorities. So we are not going to convince this Supreme Court to reinstate the Voting Rights Act, because they are firmly committed to a political racial narrative in which racial discrimination against minorities is over and racial discrimination against whites is rampant. But we do have the power to change a political discourse, to elect different presidents who will appoint different people, and to change and to restore equal protection that way by changing the composition of the Supreme Court. If I understand you correctly, you're saying that the dog whistle politics is a tool used by uh, politicians and other people in the media to advance uh, conservative policies and against the self-interest of the not 47% of the people that uh, Romney was um, courting, uh, the, uh, the people that you described that, that voted for him. And uh, you seem to imply that they're responding to fear against their self-interest. What could, what other kinds of motivations, possibly even fear, could be as strong or stronger than that to help them coincidentally vote in their own self-interest and perhaps reverse this trend that you're describing? Fabulous question. Fabulous question. So I want to reiterate this point because I, I, I really do, this is such a core point. I think when people start talking about race, there's a tendency for audiences to say, okay, if it's race, then it must be about poor minorities and maybe that's not me. Or maybe they say, and I got it, that's important, but this is an economic crisis, I'm going to get to that later. And I really want to emphasize this is about elites using this as a tool in order to enact policies that really favor the elites. And, and we're, we're talking the 1% or even less than the 1%. Now, I actually think this is really bad for elites too. This is really short-sighted of elites. They are destroying our society and they're destroying the capacity of the middle class to serve as consumers. They're endangering a, a democracy. So I, I don't think this is good for them, but I do think that they think that there's a, a segment of them the Koch brothers, who think it's good for them, right? And so Koch brothers, um, uh, Fox News, Mitt Romney, they are self-consciously using appeals to racial anxiety as a way to garner support for policies that they think are good for the 1%. And I think it's just really, really important that that's the story that we're telling. Now, are there stories we might tell the 99% that will motivate them uh, to, to reject this? I think there's a couple of stories. One, I think there's a story of hope. I think there's a story of unity. I think there's a story of togetherness, right? And I think that, that when, when Barack Obama started to say in his second term, um, we are a nation of everybody in this together rather than everybody go it alone, he was starting to tell that narrative. And I think that that narrative of hope and togetherness um, can be really empowering. So I want to stress that. And I also want to say, we can't build a political movement based upon hope alone. People want to know what happened to them and who did it, right? And so there was a, 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 a I, I read this great quote, resentment abhors a vacuum. 
people need to know who's at fault, right? And you can think back to Teddy Roosevelt and his malefactors of great wealth, right? Or to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who invited the hostility of the elite because he knew that people needed to know who the enemy was. And, I, and I, I'm not for uh, um, demonizing anybody, right? But I am for saying there are powerful social forces at work, powerful economic forces at work that are screwing the rest of us. And we need to band together not only out of this sense of unity of, of purpose and mutual respect, but also out of a sense that we're not going to let them get away with it. We're not going to let them transfer trillions of dollars to the very rich while preaching the, the benefits of trickle-down economics that actually leaves the middle class destitute and with no route of upward mobility, not for themselves and not for our children. Right? So I, I want liberals to be positive and uplifting, and I also want them to point fingers and say, there are malefactors of great wealth, people who think that because they're super rich, they should decide what's best for the rest of us. And I think we need to speak out about that and say, no, we want our society back. We want our government back. I want to thank you for mentioning Bill Clinton sure. and his Chameleon Act. Mm -hmm. um, however, you also use the punch, parry, and kick, which included only conservative examples. And so my question is, if dog whistles are so harmful, why does the left get a free pass with the dot, 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 but more extensively used by the right? I, I, it's a great question. And so there I would say, look, um, um, this is, it's very important to understand that dog whistle politics has been used specifically to resurrect a conservatism a hostility towards the New Deal that was overwhelmingly rejected by the country in 1964. Th that's the central story. But I think it's also important to notice that the left, that Democrats have had a really flawed response. And the flawed response has been either to try and avoid race or to mimic, to impersonate dog whistle politics and therefore to shift to the right. So I do believe that Democrats are culpable. And I do believe, and I, and I have a chapter on, on Clinton, and, I, and, I, and, and in fact, I talk about the way in which Hillary Clinton in 2008 also made clear she understood the power of race. Um, she had a, a, um, a statement where she was saying uh, Obama could not be the candidate because he wasn't going to do well enough among work, uh, white, the white working class, right? And what, she, and what she's saying, and, and I, I wouldn't describe this as dog whistle politics. I would describe this as uh, racial real politics. What she's saying is, hey, race is a power phenomena, so nominate me, a white person, right? So she understands race, right? So I do believe that Democrats should come in for serious criticism. Do they deserve as much criticism as the right, as the Kochs, as Fox News? No, no, they don't. So I'm curious um, to get your thoughts on uh, the politics of, or the rhetoric of gay marriage and how it relates to dog whistle politics, if you think it's, as successful? I think that's a wonderful question. I think in a way that allows us to see this can be transcended. So when I say dog whistle politics, uh, dog whistle politics could be generic. It could be anything. And in fact, it's been multiple different social provocations. It has been race, but it's also been sexual orientation. It's also been gender. It's certainly been abortion. It's also been religion. It's also been guns. Now, I want to make clear. I think race is the model, and I also think it's the primary driver of conservative politics. And indeed, there's some interesting um, uh, political science on this showing that if you know someone's conservative, the thing you are most likely to know about them is that they're also racially prejudiced, right? That these two, and again, there's nothing inherent in this. This wasn't true 50 years ago but it is made true through this process of linking conservatism to a racial narrative. So I want to say race is primary. But it's also true that there are all these other social provocations being used, and gay marriage is absolutely one of them. But what has happened? In the context of a social movement that has sought to humanize gay marriage, that has sought to put a human face on marriage equality and to say, hey, you know us. You don't need to fear us. We are you. We're your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter. We're your parents. Right? 
don't be divided by people who are trying to stampede you out of some sort of uh, fears of us. In the face of that social movement, the power of uh, that sort of dog whistling has diminished. Now, we should be clear, it's diminished across 16, 18 states. I don't know that it's going to diminish among, there's a hand, there's probably 25, 26 states, right? In the same way that you see the sort of red-blue division, so it's not entirely uplifting. But it is a message of hope in the sense that it says this sort of politics can be transcended through broad social movements that simply reach out across these purported divisions and say, we're all in this together. There's no, re to, no reason to be afraid of us. We're people, just people. I say that we really don't have a media, and it's not a very free media. Um, there's not a very wide range of discussion on the Sunday talk shows. Much important information is left out, and there's a great deal of nonsense that goes on just in the average broadcast. What are we going to do to, um, I don't think we can reform corporate media. We need to go around them. What are your thoughts no, on I that? Think you, I think you may, may well be right. So I think we should be clear that the media has been part of the problem. That when you have politicians talking, using some of these narratives, I, I think, for example, of Ronald Reagan um, talking about the threat coming across the southern border or talking about crime, media starts to report on those stories. Now, they report not only on the fact that you have a politician saying this, but then they actually start to do stories on this purported threat. So when Reagan starts to talk about crime, the amount of reporting on crime goes up two or three hundred percent. Not the amount of crime, but the amount of reporting on crime. The same thing with undocumented immigrants. Now, Reagan said, um, what was he, some crazy line, like M Managua is closer to us than Havana or something like that. They're pouring across the border. People didn't share that fear. But as he talked about the, the, the threat coming across the southern border, that fear developed, and the media reported on it, and it, and it fueled that flame. Right? OK. So in this sense, I think the media has been a part of the problem, complicit, refusing to see the way in which these narratives are racial, they have also participated in these racial narratives and, and amplified them. Where does that leave us today? I think today it leaves us with a need to find alternative ways to reach people, right? to maybe go around corporate media. That's the uplifting version. The not so uplifting version is media fragmentation and the fragmentation of the public so that we're all just talking to each other and how do we reach across lines. So I don't think that the solution is going to be m media first. I think it's got to be social movement and, the so and, the, and social movement efforts to create connections. And that's the only way we're really going to start talking to each other. A lot of what you have said tonight really kind of um, starts to really focus on conservatives. And I was wondering if there was a way that you might have it so that it's not alienating a certain populace so that we can really bring uh, racism as an awareness to the whole, to everyone, that they're not, no longer focusing on politics per se, but that both sides are doing it equally. And that well, we need to be well, aware that it's okay, not so, conservatives. Okay, so I, I can oh, definitely oh. alienate liberals too. <laughs> And indeed, I, I actually think liberals are going to be, a certain segment of the Democratic Party is going to be really upset with this book. The, the, the Clinton camp, they're not going to be happy. Neither is the Obama camp. I actually have a chapter on Obama, and I say, Obama's politics is what he calls post-racialism. But listen to the logic of post-racialism. Post-racialism says race is so divisive we shouldn't talk about it. That's colorblindness. Right? His solution to race is to not talk about it. Now, he says, to give him credit, and then I'll take it away, but to give him credit, he says, listen, if we don't talk about race, that frees us up to enact liberal solutions. And minorities are actually going to be better off with some liberal solutions, um, better off than they would be if we tried race-targeted solutions that we could never get through. Right? So that's the logic. And it seems like what he's saying is, we're not going to talk about race, and actually we're going to move towards racial justice that way. But in fact, he misunderstands, or at least isn't up front with us, about the way in which liberalism itself is demonized. And he can't afford to embrace liberal solutions, even universal ones, because those are seen in racial terms. So the net result is no talk about race and no liberal solutions for anybody. 
right? So I'm, re so I'm really quite critical about Obama too. So yes, I can alienate everybody. <laughs> that said, one of the great dangers of current racial discourse, and here Obama engages in this too, is what I call racial symmetry. To, to always equate what's going on among whites with what's going on among minorities, right? And so Obama did this, for example, in his Philadelphia speech, where he talked about uh, a white bigotry, um, uh, and, and indeed uh, on the part of his grandmother, as somehow the equivalent of Reverend Wright and anger in the black community. These are not equivalent. We have a long and ugly history of white racism predicated on the notion of white superiority and on the inferiority of minorities tied to notions of our criminality, our, our laziness, our lack of intelligence. And when minorities turn around and say, hold on, that stuff's ugly, we need to refuse to be divided against uh, by it, and by the way, we're a little ticked off by all of you people saying this stuff, those aren't equivalent. Right? It's appropriate for people of color, it's appropriate for liberals in general to be mad about race baiting. And our anger, our rejection, our repudiation of this politics that taints us with ugly racial innuendos and that harms all of us e economically is not the moral or political equivalent of right-wing efforts to use ugly racial stereotypes to fool us into policies that are good for the 1%. They are simply not symmetrical, and we need to be really careful not to let that symmetry enter the conversation all the time. And just to tie it back again, this is a deeper point. Whenever I say the Republican Party is 90% white, somebody says yes, and 90 plus percent of blacks support Obama, right? And the narrative is A, this is just about racial divisions in society, but B, more fundamentally, there is racism among whites and there's racism among blacks and it's all just the same, it's all just a wash. No. There is racism among whites that is a terrible problem in society. Are there some racist minorities? Sure. But is that the social scourge that has destroyed the middle class? No. These are not equivalents. Don't let people create a false symmetry.